morning. Welcome to the Iowa Veterans Home Memorial Day program. My name is Susan Wilkinson, and I am the nursing home administrator for the Iowa Veterans Home. On behalf of our residents and our staff, thank you for spending some of your precious time with us today. This is a special day to pause and remember those who gave their lives defending our freedoms, those who made the ultimate sacrifice. Today we honor and remember those who died in service to our country. And as we remember those heroes, today we also honor their families and we make the solemn promise to never forget their loved ones. Please stand if you are able for the advancement of the colors by Boy Scout Troop 308 and please remain standing for a national anthem performed by the Marshalltown Men's Chorus. Please salute those not in uniform. Please place your right hand over your heart. Color guard forward march. Color guard halt. Color guard cross the colors. Color guard post the colors. Color guard honor your colors. Turn to ranks. Audience, please be seated. Chaplain Craig Nelson will now provide our invocation. Will you join me as we pray? Lord God, God of peace, we approach the throne of grace today in remembrance. We come before you remembering that you raised up mighty men to serve with David on the fields of battle to defend your people Israel and we are reminded that you have also raised up mighty men and women to defend this nation also. We pray today for those who laid down their lives to defend our freedoms and ask your presence with the loved ones they left behind too soon. We intercede today for those whose bodies and spirits bear the scars of their service and who struggle to this day to find peace and healing. Cover them with your grace. We raise up today all those who protect us now, especially those on fields of battle, wherever they may be. 
edge them about with a special wall of protection until you return them home to their loved ones and to their families. Finally, Lord, we would ask today that as we remember the depth of our losses and the cost of our sacrifices, that you would turn the hearts and minds of our leaders and our enemies towards peace. Amen. I'd like to take just a moment to thank all the participants in our program today. We are so grateful to have these individuals and groups step forward to help with this very important day of remembrance. First, thank you to the families of those heroes that we remember today. We're honored that you've joined us today and we are grateful that you'll be telling us about your loved ones. Thank you, Colette Bang, for providing our prelude and postlude music. Boy Scout Troops of America, Troop 308, thank you also for placing flags at the headstones in our cemetery. The Marshalltown Men's Chorus, directed by Larry Fance. United States Marines from E Company in Des Moines. Bugler Donald Peterson. Chaplain Nelson and Mr. Dean Pro from IVH. A special thank you also to Brad Shipley, Matt McAllister, Kathy Knickerbocker, and the rest of the IVH staff for coordinating today's program, and a big thanks to all our staff and volunteers who helped bring residents to our program today. The Marshalltown Men's Chorus will now sing Eternal Father, Strong to Save. Decoration Day, and the tradition of decorating graves began before the end of the Civil War. General John Logan of the Grand Army of the Republic, an organization of veterans, proclaimed this statement in his General Order No. 11. The 30th day of May, 1868, is designated for the purpose of strewing with flowers or otherwise decorating the graves of comrades who died in defense of their country during the late rebellion, and whose bodies now lie in almost every city, village, and hamlet churchyard in the land. In this observance, no form of ceremony is prescribed, but posts and comrades will in their own way arrange such fitting services and testimonials of respect as circumstances may permit. 
It is fitting today that we have invited the families of those we remember today. We're honored that they have come to share with us about their loved ones. We can never fully express our gratitude, but we can promise to always remember their service and sacrifice. It's my pleasure to introduce you today, Sally Ashen, who is the mother of Major Sean Ashen. Hello, how are you today? I'm not sure if Brad did the right thing in asking me to be first, but I'll do my best. Um, I'm here, why, what do I think of Memorial Day and what does it mean to me? Well, Memorial Day is the day that we can remember our loved ones, even though we think about them every day, every week. Um, it's a certain time that we can just spend putting flowers on their graves or going to their graves and praying. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is a special time that I would like to spend in honor of my family that I have lost. My father was George Sports, Nani Sports. They both lived here about 10 years. My dad was in the Second World War and he fought for his country. He was at the Battle of the Bulge in Normandy Bay. He would not talk about his times in the military, in the war, the whole time we were growing up as kids. I didn't even hear him talk to my mother about it, but as he, when he came here, he would share with me a few things that he went through. And one little thing was that he told me that when he, his troops, he told his troops, he said, there's light land mines around all over, um, follow my steps and you'll be okay. I honor my dad today and love him dearly and miss him dearly and um, he taught us kids good work ethics and um, I'm proud of him. Today I'm also here to speak of my son Sean. I lost him July 4th, 2011. He was an amazing son like we all think are all of us think our children are amazing, and they are. Um, Sean was just one of those guys that he could meet a stranger, and before you know it, his stranger was giggling and smiling, and so was Sean. Um, it's really hard to have lost him, but I can go on by the help of God and the prayers of my friends and family and church. As I said, Sean, um, I remember one time, and he called me on the phone and he said, Mama, I said, yeah, Sean, what's going on? He said, can you pray for me? It was when he was captain. He said, I have to go to a family. Uh, one of the girls in my battalion um, went off the dock and was killed. And I have to go share that with the family. And he says, why, well, I don't want to do that. And I goes, well, I'll pray for you, Sean. Little did I know that that was going to happen to me. Just a few years later, I would get that knock at the door. And um, it was the hardest thing I'd ever gone through, but I made it. Um, I know Sean, another little thing I remember about Sean was uh, he was out jogging and he, he, he'd call me on the phone any little time and he'd say, Mom, he said, you know, I walk, I jog by this house every day and there's this little boy, probably about 12, 13 on the porch in a wheelchair and he said, I'd stop and talk to him and we'd become real good friends. And then I noticed his mom looking out the window and she was listening to what I was saying. And she said, then one day she came out and she said, Sean, thank you for taking time to talk to my son. Uh, he doesn't have a lot of friends and people just don't talk to him like that. And Sean said, well, would you mind if I would take him to McDonald's tomorrow? And she said, oh, that would be awesome. That would be really good. So anyway, Sean had a big heart and he loved people. 
He would always call me his mama bear. I'll never forget that until the day I die. Um, Sean, like I said, died July 4, 2011. Um, a lot of people will ask me, well, well, did Sean die in infantry? Did he die in Afghanistan, um, Iraq? No, that's not how I lost Sean. When Sean was a captain, he was in South Carolina, and they were out in uh, field duty, and there was a big storm coming up, and they had to quick get one of these huge, and some of you know what I'm talking about, tents up because of a storm coming up. And uh, he was directing his soldiers on how to hold the pole up so that they could get this pole lined up on the tent to put it up. Well, unfortunately, it had started to rain a little bit, and one of the troops um, slipped on the grass, and unfortunately, my son got hit with this pole in the back of his head. And we have four ventricles in the back of our head, and he, all those were crushed which he had to have major brain surgery, and of course I was there through the whole thing. It did not go well. Sean really wasn't the same since then, but he was determined to go on. He was not a quitter. He, 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 his goal was just to keep going. And he went on to be a major and ready to be a lieutenant colonel when he died. Sean died of um, an aneurysm from his heart, from his brain surgery, and um, I guess that's all I had to say. Just uh, pray for all the fallen soldiers when they lose their sons and daughters because I know how that feels, and the best thing you can do for them is to pray for their family, and thank you very much. Thank you, Sally. Our next speaker is Candy Vaughn. She's the mother of Specialist Travis Vaughn, um, who died in Afghanistan in 2007. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. I was really humbled when I was asked to come and speak to you all today. I kind of feel a connection with a lot of you here in the room. Um, I don't know if I look familiar to some of you or not, but our, my family's way of honoring Travis is to come here every day or every year and do the shower of gifts and bring a U-Haul full of items for you guys. That is the one thing my husband decided from the beginning that he wanted to do every year to honor you guys and to honor Travis and to make sure that Travis wasn't forgotten. Travis was killed in Afghanistan in a helicopter, in a Chinook helicopter crash. There were 22 on board, 14 survived, and seven were killed. When Travis first joined the military, it was to get out of the cornfield. <laughs> Some of you can relate to that. He was working part-time, going to college part-time, and just struggling, just trying to get by. And when he joined, he joined with the college in the back of his mind, thinking, yeah, my college is gonna get paid for. However, the recruiter was very clear to Travis and I, the two times that we went and asked 101 questions, was that Travis would have to go to Afghanistan for at least a year. And he knew that, and he was still okay with signing on the dotted line. He was going to go serve his country and get a little something back out of it. He never did take one college course. He was too busy studying and learning about the Chinook. He initially was, um, did the work, the repair on the Chinook. He worked on them. Well, after he got to know the Chinook and got up close and personal with it, it wasn't enough to just fix them and work on them. He wanted to fly in them. 
So when Travis this helicopter crashed, it was his first time being the crew chief on board that helicopter. And I like to think in my own mind as the helicopter was going down, means he was the crew chief, it was his job to figure out what was the matter with it and what he could do to get it to stay up. And then after we find out, you know, after it crashed, a part of the helicopter had smacked Travis on the back of the head and he was killed instantly. He had a lot of things that were broken and damaged to his body. However, he looked absolutely perfect at the funeral. I was thinking back nine years ago to Memorial Day and American Legion Auxiliary invited my family to come to a memorial service like this and we were given a blue star and a gold star flag at the same time. And we didn't know what either one of them meant. Of course, we should have gotten the blue flag first for a while to show that our son was serving and the gold star shows that our son was killed. After I got involved with the American Legion Auxiliary, I learned about the veterans' home here in Marshalltown. I lived in Rhinebeck at the time. So I came here and did a tour. I didn't even know this place existed. And so that first time I came and did my tour, I met my favorite, okay, <laughs> maybe I might hurt a few feelings, but he is my favorite Vietnam veteran, Mike Krosky. On my first tour here, I met Mike. And Mike and I sat in the hallway and visited. And when I left here that day, I realized Mike had been the president of the Residential Council for 12 years, and all he had was his voice, his mouth. And I'm like, I got a big mouth. <laughs> like Mike, yes, I have a big mouth. I could do something with my big mouth. For one, it was most important that Travis would not be forgotten. The second was that you all and your sacrifices and your service was not forgotten either. So we get to kill two birds with one stone when we come here on February 18th, the day Travis was killed. And we spend it with you, show you love, you show us your love and the support, and I can tell you, we leave here almost feeling guilty because we've had such an amazing day with all of you on that day. And I joke around and say, well, we could either be drunk in a bar or here with you that day. And it's a beautiful thing for my family and I hope for you all. And I have to say, when we heard that Travis was first killed, we were told that we were part of a Gold Star family, a family that you never want to be part of, but once you are, you're stuck with them forever. And that was said to us by a military person. But I can tell you, it's you guys that are my family. It's the other Gold Star family members that I've met in the last nine years that go on this horrible journey of grief and trying to make any kind of sense out of why it happened. And I've said for the last nine years, we could sit around and wonder why Travis was killed. There would be nothing good to come out of Travis's death unless we actually made something good come out of it. And that's what we try to do every year and come and bless you guys and show you our support. But thank you for the love and your support back. Thanks for having me today. Thank you, Candy. Our next speaker is Jerry Nicely Moore. She was um, the wife of Sergeant First Class Scott Nicely, who died in Iraq in 2006. Good morning. I'm glad to be 
honored, I'm honored to be here to speak to you today about my husband, my family. Uh, I grew up not really having an idea of Memorial Day. My, even though my father served in World War II in the South Pacific in the Navy, he came back and he never was comfortable talking about his service and it wasn't anything that we ever um, participated in. And uh, you know, it was just a long three-day weekend, barbecues and having fun and that kind of thing. Uh, until I met my husband in college, uh, that all changed. Uh, he was a very patriotic person from birth, I believe. He was born several minutes after midnight on July 5th. And uh, his life moved on from there. His father was in the military, as was his three brothers. And actually, he joined the Marine Corps on a dare from one of his older brothers, because his brother said he was too much of a wuss to be able to make it through boot camp. And he decided to prove them wrong. So he took a, a semester off from college, went through boot camp, came back to school, and uh, I met him a year or two later. We were to be married a few years after that, and our life went on to um, being a, a Marine officer family, and uh, he took his commission on his graduation day from college, and uh, we traveled around the United States from there, went to a lot of different places. He was on a lot of different deployments. As a matter of fact, we spent our first two years married uh, with him being gone uh, for six months at a time. He was gone for all the holidays, the birth of our first child. Uh, it, was, it was a difficult life, but uh, I was appreciative of it because there were a lot of benefits that were given to us too. Um, our lives progressed. We ended up having another child, uh, Sarah, and our first child was Justin. Scott ended up getting promoted and uh, ended up retiring after 15 years as a major in the Marine Corps. He loved the military with all his heart. He bled red, white, and blue. Uh, he had three years in the Marine Reserves. Um, we settled here in Marshalltown in 1994. As a matter of fact, his first job after getting out was uh, spending a year here at the Veterans Home. And um, after that, he moved on to work in the Marshalltown Post Office. He missed the military, something fierce. He was only out for about a year and a half. And he would talk a lot when he'd come home from work. He met a lot of people at the post office that were prior military. And uh, he'd say, you know, I'd be kind of liking to do that. And I'd think, oh, yeah, OK, whatever. Well, one day he came home late from work. At the time, we lived at 9th and Summit Street, right across the street from the armory. And he came in like a little boy from a candy shop. Guess what I did? I don't have a clue. I enlisted in the Iowa National Guard. And I'm like, you did what? Are you freaking kidding me? We've already been through all this. And I got to thinking, well, okay, it's, you know, a month out of the summer or two weeks out of the summer and, and, and you know, one weekend a month we can do this. But, but what about the money? You know, what rank are you? Because I was thinking, okay, he went back in as an officer. Nope, I'm an enlisted guy. I went in as a sergeant. And I'm like, oh, for heaven's sakes. Well, because I figured if he was going to be gone away from home, the least he could do is put a few bucks in his pocket. <laughs> he said, nope, I never went into the military for power, prestige, or money. I, I love the military. I miss the guys, the camaraderie. I want to play in the dirt and play with the toys. And uh, I thought, OK. Well, little did we know. As time progressed, he had a small deployment where they went to Panama for the summer. Probably a year later, they were on a nine-month deployment to the Sinai Peninsula for a peacekeeping mission. And then a year and a half later, uh, they were sent to Iraq. Uh, during this time, our children were growing. They were in high school, graduating. They missed uh, my daughter's graduation. 
It was just things you learned to deal with as a military spouse because that's just the way life was. Um, it was difficult having him go to Iraq. I, I was pretty, uh, that was probably the most stressed out that I, I ever was about him leaving. But I still tried not to think that he wouldn't ever return. That was never in the back of my mind. Um, our, our children got married, moved on with their lives, and I just was waiting for him to come home. Then almost a year to the day uh, that they were gone, I got that knock on the door. It uh, was one of the most unbelievable experiences of my life. And um, then after that, the next month was just a whirlwind. Uh, it was step by step with other people guiding me. You, you just go through the motions to wait for his body to come back to the States. And then we had a big event here in Marshalltown, and then we uh, had his body taken back home to Syracuse, Nebraska. That's where he wanted to be buried, if anything had happened to him, where he could be close to his family and where he grew up. And so that's where he lays now. And uh, I'm just honored for the person that he was. Even though he loved being a Marine, he loved being an officer, um, he knew deep down that the heart and soul of the military were the enlisted ranks. And he just um, enjoyed spending time with those men. And um, this last deployment, I heard a lot of things from the guys when they came back after, uh, um, because they had to spend another nine months, 10 months there before they were able to return. Their battalion was the longest serving uh, Iowa National Guard unit. They were there almost two years. And um, they shared a lot of memories with me, saying how Scott was just uh, an honorable man. He had a lot of character, integrity, courage, and being one of the older people in the battalion and in his small unit, um, he was willing to share all those things with these young men who were experiencing difficulties and hardships being away from their families and loved ones for so long. Uh, before he died, he was supposed to be getting his leave in August, and he kept canceling it and pushing it back, and he would call me and say, I'm, I'm not coming home for my leave yet, I'm not coming home, and I, I was getting very frustrated and saying, why? Why do you keep pushing your leave back? Because you and I have been here a lot. We know how to do this. We know how to get through this. I have to help these young men and, and their families that are struggling. They need to go home and be with their families. Just give me some time and, and I'll be home soon enough. We'll plan a nice Christmas. And uh, that never happened. So that was very difficult for me. But one of the last things that he wrote to me that I, I wanted to share in a letter, it was kind of a poem. It said, a friend so rare, you stand by me no matter what the good or bad of my life. You never disappoint me when I need to depend on your support. You tell me when I'm wrong. You love me even when we disagree. Each night, each day and night, I feel your presence. You may not be near to touch, but you are in my mind and heart. You meet my needs so silently. I'm not alone because of you. Whatever I am that causes you to love me with this loyalty, I pray that I am as much for you as you are for me. I love you. That was one of the last letters that I received from him. And um, I just cherish his memory. I love to talk about him. <laughs> probably some people think I wish, they probably wish I'd be quiet more often. <laughs> but um, uh, being a part of this community has been a blessing because even though he wasn't a native son of your community, um, this community, now my community, um, you've loved us, 
You've taken our family in. You've honored my husband and his service. And um, I'm just so grateful for being a part of all of this. I, I appreciate being able to have the opportunity to speak, share my story about my husband. He was a wonderful man with a wonderful sense of humor. And I miss that most. And then I'll finish up with this. You went away leaving me with the memories we made, memories of those sweet yesterdays spent with you. And even though you're gone, I still think of you often. I love you, my friend, the one who shared my dreams, my life, and my love. Also, I would like for you to keep my son in your prayers a year after he, uh, my husband Scott died, Justin decided to join the Army. He was a year active duty, regular Army, and then after that was selected uh, to participate and became a Green Beret in the Special Forces, and is now stationed at uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Um, however, he also got selected for another program right now. Uh, we'll be moving to D.C. area in the next month. I have no idea what that is, nor will I ever, because it's even more top secret stuff. So whatever that is, uh, just keep him and, and his family in your prayers. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. We promise to always remember your loved ones. Thank you for sharing your memories with us today. The Marshalltown Men's Choir will now sing Blades of Grass and Pure White Stones. Oh, mm -hmm. 
to bring our wreath forward. Division. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pro. General George S. Patton prayed in the soldier's prayer. Let me not mourn for the men who have died fighting, but rather let me be glad that such heroes have lived. We are grateful for their service and their ultimate sacrifice. Thank you for joining us to honor our American heroes. Their sacrifice is not in vain as long as we take time to remember and honor them. Chaplain Nelson will provide our benediction followed by the rifle salute and the playing of taps. During the playing of taps, if you are able to stand, you may stand with your hand over your heart, and veterans may render the hand salute. Please stand now if you are able. Will you join me in prayer? Our veterans were quicker than eagles and stronger than lions as they came to assist their nation. It's our duty to make sure that the memory of their sacrifice and heroic deeds will not be forgotten. May the peace that you left us, the peace you gave us, be the peace that sustains us and the peace that saves us. Amen. Color guard, please retire the colors. Color guard retrieves the colors. Color guard return to ranks. Color Guard Hall. Two. Audience, thank you for joining us. Color Guard dismissed. Thank you for joining us. That concludes our program for today. Sally Ashen, and I'm here to represent my father who was in the Second World War, Battle of Bulge, Normandy Bay. And um, I, I admire him. He's passed away, and uh, he's in heaven. And I'm also here to speak of my son, Sean Ashen, that was uh, um, in the Army following his grandpa. And he um, was had a serious injury and uh, head injury, had to have brain surgery and uh, he passed away of an aneurysm. 
he had that when he was a major and went on to be a, uh, or a captain and went on to be a major and on to be a lieutenant colonel, ready to be a lieutenant colonel. Um, but he was a strong man and he loved his country and he wouldn't quit. He wanted to just keep going on as far as he could and he did. And so um, I just want to thank all the soldiers and troops that have fought for our country. Um, I really appreciate everything they've done. And um, I know if my dad or my son was here, he would be, they would be honored to be here to, to salute and thank the soldiers that have fought th through the wars that have been in the past. And uh, just wanted to just say a little bit about my loved ones and I miss them so very much. You know, I feel Travis when we come here every year, we spend the 18th, the, the day he was killed, up here and we bring a U-Haul full of stuff and just share our stories. It's a it's an easy place for us to get to talk about Travis and his death. Um, these people share their stories with us and their tears. And so it's just a really good place as far as the emotional part of it. And then like I said, when we leave to go home, we almost feel guilty that we've had such a beautiful day with all of these veterans. And I don't think Travis would want us to be anywhere else or do anything else to honor him on the day he was killed. But to be here with all of his new family, his army brothers and sisters, there's that camaraderie. And I started to kind of touch on that. That's what we've built, or I've built, with some of the other Gold Star families. Over the last nine years, um, one of the Gold Star wife is one of my best friends. And she brought me here today. Just moral support. She wasn't going to talk, but um, the camaraderie that's built between the Army family, the Trav has all these other brothers and sisters, you know, we're kind of part of that family in a weird way, but it's Gold Star families. All weekend I tried writing some things down about what I wanted to speak about, and then I got to thinking, if I have to write things down about my husband, I have an issue. I should be able to just speak about the man because his life was amazing and I was with him almost 30 years. So um, it, uh, it was okay. I, I went to bed last night uh, after watching several videos from around the time when he passed. You know, his funeral video and all these different things and it kind of gave me um, a closeness to him for the weekend. It brought some sadness on. I had my opportunity to do my crying, and then I went to bed with some prayers, asking God to give me peace so I could rest and wake up refreshed and come here and be calm and that he would give me the words to say. And um, honestly, I believe that Scott, um, he loved the military, he loved his country, he, he was very patriotic, he was a very Christian man. He. Um, he would have been honored to come here today and speak to the veterans about his service, their service, what they gave to their country and how he appreciated and uh, loved them. We had a really good turnout today from the community and we're grateful when people come up and um, take time out of their days to honor veterans and to remember. We had three wonderful speakers today, um, Sally Ashen who lost her son. Um, we had Jerry Nicely Moore, who lost her husband, Scott, and we had um, Candy Vaughn, who lost her son, Travis. Um, they have very moving stories who, it, it really does um, portray what service is about and how, um, it's not just the time that the loved ones are away from you, but um, the cost later when we realize that they're not coming home. So it made this day even more important and much more memorable to have real stories from real people. It was very emotional service. Um, we had great music from the Marshalltown Men's Choir. Um, we had lots of um, volunteers and support. So it made this day very, very special. And we loved your national anthem singer.